And good to see all of you here this evening. We appreciate you being here. It looks like it's the top of the hour. So uh, we'll get ready to begin our, our Bible class. Appreciate so much you being here. And uh, in this class, our auditorium class, of course, we have a uh, high school uh, class, uh, younger, upstairs. We have the college students in the front side of the annex and the young adults in the back side of the annex. So we're grateful for the opportunity to provide different classes and teachers who are, are teaching this evening. And we're grateful to you being here. You know, if you weren't here, I'd just be talking to myself, and I do that enough during the day. So uh, no sense in doing it tonight uh, as well. Appreciate so much you being here. We're going to continue looking at the Pentateuch um, as far as um, introduction uh, notes. Uh, you'll see what's on the white tables out, out uh, just outside of the auditorium. It's different than what you had last week. Uh, a few more thoughts uh, uh, by way of introduction. So if you did not get one of those, you're welcome to get one uh, at this time. Um, and uh, or raise your hand. I see some guys heading that way, and uh, I'm sure they'll be happy to to, to help you out there um, if uh, if you need one uh, for for tonight. Then, Lord willing, next week uh, we'll get into Genesis one. But there's some more uh, information that I wanted to cover. Just some general uh, information uh, about uh, uh, about these five books about the law. And uh, just some general, mo most of it you'll know, most of it you will, it will be familiar to you, but I think it's good to highlight some of that just as, uh, just as by way of reminder, some of the stuff that, uh, so if you need one, raise your hand. Anyone, if others need, need some? Wow, very good. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, that, no, no shame in it, Carly. Carlene's used to raising her hands on Wednesday morning Bible class. I just called you out, didn't I? <laughs> I didn't even use it. Oh, boy. We started our Wednesday morning. Anybody else need one? Jason's back there. Anybody else need one? All right. All right. I think we're good. Thank you. Thank you, man. Thank you for doing that. I appreciate that. So we started our Wednesday morning Bible class back this morning. We had taken a break since uh, Thanksgiving uh, up until this morning, and uh, we had 17, so we're grateful for that. Uh, we've been in the book of Acts for um, a couple of years now, but uh, Lord willing, uh, when we wrap it up in the last Wednesday in April, uh, we will complete the book of Acts, and uh, so if you're free, Wednesday morning at 10 a.m., uh, men or women, all ages, you're welcome to come and be with us in the Annex, and, uh, and uh, we appreciate uh, those who were there um, this morning. Before we get into our study, uh, we will we'll have our prayers. We want to remember Greg and others who are traveling to uh, CYC Dallas. Uh, some of them left today, and um, appreciate. I'm always encouraged when people from our home congregation go elsewhere to bless other people. That's just a wonderful thing. Uh, whether you're on vacation and you visit with a sister congregation or you're helping with work like CYC or whatever it might be, just, it's just it's good to know that, that we have people who can go out and help others and encourage others. So let's keep all those uh, in, in our prayers who are traveling to, uh, to Dallas uh, to help with that event this weekend. I um, want to also remember the family of Jack Dover. Uh, you, don't, you do not know Jack Dover. Uh, he was my grandmother's cousin. He passed on Sunday. His funeral will be tomorrow. We'll be going down and uh, I'll be taking a small part in that funeral tomorrow night. Um, Jack was one of the two men uh, at the first congregation where I preached uh, who offered that preaching position to me. And um, so it's kind of interesting the way it came about. Their preacher died suddenly and unexpectedly, unexpectedly on a Saturday and uh, so uh, I, I was thinking that maybe I would like to preach. I'd only been a Christian for a couple of years, so I wasn't so sure if I should do that or not. Uh, but um, but uh, with the family ties, I, I, I said I would, I would tr try out. Uh, and, but uh, before I did, I, I, I kind of went backtracked a little bit. I said, I'll, I'll, I'll still preach for you. I've already committed to it, but I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to. I don't want to be in. I don't want to be considered for this position and um, so a couple weeks later it was Jack Dover who called and he said I want you to reconsider I want you to take this position and so I did and that was 20 years ago this coming July and um, I think the road was leading to ministry and preaching either way but it would not have started then it would not have started then without that phone call so I'll always be grateful for this great man he preached uh, the last 15 years of his life he actually preached himself did a lot of good work and his funeral will be tomorrow so Again, you don't know him. You won't know him this side of eternity, uh, but uh, had a lot, of, a lot of influence on me in my life. Other, uh, other prayer request. Sh 
sure. Absolutely. Thank you. We'll continue to pray for the lost and homeless and hungry. So grateful for Charles and his humble heart and uh, making this prayer request each, uh, each week. I'm sorry to hear that, Charles. I'm sorry to hear that. Charles had an aunt to pass away recently. Let's remember Charles' family in our prayers. Any other requests? Okay, let's, uh, let's pray. Our God and Father in heaven, we're so thankful for this day of life that you have given us. We're grateful, Father, for the opportunity to be here together this evening for all the classes that we have. Uh, the teachers who are teaching, uh, all who are assembled to come together and to study. Bless our classes, bless our devotional later, those who will lead us in song and prayer and the devotional thought. Father, we're grateful for uh, workers, willing workers, uh, and we're, we're thankful, Father, for all who are here, especially those who have their children and grandchildren here. Help us to influence uh, these young people to have their own faith in you, their own love for you. Uh, help us to do all we can to support these families who are uh, trying to, uh, to teach their children in, in the ways of your word. Father, we are mindful of Greg and others who will travel a uh, great distance to Dallas uh, to be a part of this work. We pray that it will be a good work to help the kingdom according to your word. We pray for traveling mercies upon all who uh, will make the journey there and back. Father, bless us this year and all that we do here at Wood Avenue, uh, whether planned events through Connect or summer series, vacation Bible school, or just our daily lives and whatever we're doing, help us to be found faithful and glorify you with our words and our thoughts and our actions. Father, we are grateful for the life of Jack Dover and what he has meant to so many. We pray now that you'll be with his family, his, his, his good wife, his children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren and all that he uh, has helped in his life. And We ask your blessings to be upon them in the coming days. Father, please be with Charles and his family, the passing of a loved one, and help them to find their comfort and strength in you and your word and family and Christian family as well. Keep us in your care and help us to do all things to please you is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so what we're looking at this evening, I want to just go back and kind of continue some of what we were talking about last week when we were talking about the first five books of the Old Testament, the law books. And as I mentioned last week, you can take the Old Testament books and um, break them out down into sections of 5 or 12, the, the law being 5, and then uh, 12 uh, books of history, 5 books of poetry, 5 books of major prophets, and 12 books of minor prophets. So that's how you can break down the 39 books of the Old Testament. And, but within these first five books, remember there's a change from uh, Genesis in the patriarchal period to Exodus forward. Uh, in the Mosaical or the Jewish period, uh, but yet they're still uh, coupled together as these books of the law. And what I've given you tonight are just a, a few thoughts of some of the main points that stand out. They, these are what I think about when I think about these five books, and most of them will be familiar to you, uh, but um, there will probably be others maybe that uh, you think about uh, to remember from these five books uh, as well, I think it's important, especially when studying these Old Testament books. You know, uh, so we don't study them as much uh, as we do the New Testament books. I don't know if that's good or not. Um, uh, I can understand why we might study the New Testament more, but we need, definitely need to spend a lot of time in studying the Old Testament. Uh, they're, they're generally longer. Their verses, their chapters, and their books are usually longer. It takes a little more time and effort, but I do think it's important whether you're stu studying the Old Testament or New Testament is to try to at least remember some, some, some main points that, that, that could draw your attention to it, uh, to, to what you're studying or recall of, well, I know it's in this book or something like that. I think one way that helps that if you can remember how many chapters are in a book, if, you know, and I don't necessarily, I don't know all the chapters of every book, but I think that sometimes is helpful if you remember how many chapters are in a book and have a better idea of remembering what is in that book. So let's notice some valuable life lessons uh, from, uh, from these books, from the first five books uh, of the Old Testament. One, I've given you, uh, which would be letter A on your outline, God loves you and provides a way even when you mess up. Uh, so if you remember, Genesis chapter 1 is the creation. Chapter 2 gives us a little more information, a little more detail about the creation of uh, man and woman. Then chapter 3, you have sin. You have sin entering 
uh, where uh, Eve is deceived and she eats of the fruit and um, then she gives to her husband Adam and he is, eats of it as well. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. We oftentimes say here's the first, uh, first prophecy of Jesus, first messianic uh, prophecy. Uh, what would then would fill the rest of the Old Testament with a number of messianic prophecies uh, about, uh, about Jesus. Um, I try to remind myself and even try to say that this is the first time it was revealed uh, that we see in Scripture. But remember, God, when you study the book of Ephesians, um, he had a predetermined plan. He, he had a plan. And so, um, you know, that, that plan was there uh, all along. But uh, what we see in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, uh, there, there will be a way. There will be a way. Now, biblical history, most would give you about 4,000 years from uh, creation to Jesus. Uh, so with that uh, being said, um, you know, God could have sent the Lord the next day if he wanted to, but he allowed his plan to come about with uh, some, some miracles on the way, along the way. Yes, this is true. There was a miraculous period that we read about in the Bible, but much of it just through his providential care. Uh, one, for example, when you count from Abraham down, so what is that? Was that about 2,500 years from Abraham to Jesus, I think? Um, you keep a male descendant. That, that in and of itself, I do believe, is a providence of God keeping a male descendant from Abraham all the way to Jesus uh, to keep that line. And so you see, you see God at work. You see God faithful to his promises uh, as, as we, as we uh, noticed last Sunday night. But here's the point that I would have us to remember tonight is Adam and Eve had just sinned. I mean, here they are in their garden, and God told them, gave them all this that he'd given them, and, but he told them back in chapter 2, there's this, there's this one tree, you don't eat of it, you do not eat of the fruit. And then they did it, they did it. And uh, in the midst of that, punishment has to enter, this is true, but God is saying, there's going to be a way, there's going to be a way, and uh, it's going to be through my son, Jesus. And, you know, I, I think that um, you, you see... God the Father coming out. You see the love there. Um, you know, when, 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 when you see that, I do believe. You choose your heart. You know, I don't know if you've, you've heard people use that phrase, choose your heart. And they say there's, there's hard things no matter what. You just got to pick which heart you're going to do. And I think about, you know, in this reflecting of God's love. And, and I think about a study of Jeremiah where where the, the kingdom is going to be lost, Babylon. And they can either stay in the city and die, or they can go off to captivity and be redeemed, but they're going to be in captivity and punished. And God's love for them told them, this is what you can do. You can pick it out. You can die in the city or you can go into captivity. It's, it's hard, but, but there was a way of redemption there. Sure. Just in, in that example here, you know, God's love reflected to Adam and Eve where they, he could have literally struck them instantaneously, but instead he tells them, this is, this is not a punishment. You, you've chosen either abstain from the fruit part, or now you're going you're gonna to suffer in childbearing and conception, and uh, Adam's going to have to work with you. You know, it's going to be hard. And so they had to choose which heart they're going to do. God gave them choice, and they, they chose the physical heart. Sure. Yeah, that's, so that's a good point. I had never really kind of thought about all of that. That's that's a good points there. And uh, you know, leaving from where they were in this beautiful garden, this paradise. You know, chapter two ends with uh, saying they were naked but not ashamed. They were sinlessly. They were sinless. They were pure. Um, you know, out of the history of the world, they're the only ones. They're the only two in the entire history of the world who could talk about the good old days because <laughs> it really was the good old days for them. There there was no misconceptions of it or building it up or anything like that but uh yeah they uh they sinned but uh you you see uh you see the love of god giving them uh this opportunity to continue on and continue on uh, with um life as you see when you get into chapter four cain and abel are born and um you, you just you see the love of god throughout and uh the bible and sometimes you hear it called the schema redemption that you see from genesis 
you know, to the end, the, th the thread of redemption sometimes. And, and you see that uh, going, going through. And, and the thing about it is sometimes you focus on the failures of the people or where they go into captivity, but we need to always look at the love of God and say, I'm giving you another chance and another chance and another chance and another chance. And on and on and on he goes with that. And, um, and because he wants us to, to be saved, so much so that he had this plan and he gave his son Jesus. So, great thought. Anything else before we move on? Okay, uh, another thing um, that, that I try to point out from the Pentateuch would be Deuteronomy chapter 8. The last of the five books, Deuteronomy chapter 8. Do not forget God, verses 6 through 14. So here you are, you have this nation of people. They're out in the wilderness. Moses, uh, with this new generation of people, wants to prepare them eventually for the direction of Joshua, the leadership of Joshua, to take them into their promised land. And you know God is promising all these great things that he's going to do for them. And he does do it for them. It's interesting, you know, if you study the Old Testament, how, how much of the end of the Bible, these major and minor prophets, tied directly back to the beginning, the, the law. You know, you, you have the law given, the promises, as well as the, 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 the condemnation, if you don't obey me. He tells them this either way, what's going to happen. But, but then you have that period in between where they leave God enough times where ultimately they have to go into captivity. And then you have these prophets at the end who are saying, look, this is why. You know, our plea is always go back to, to the Bible, right? Always go back to the New Testament. Always go back to the first century church. That's, that's the same thing as the prophets. That's what, they, that's what they were doing when you get to those last 17 books of the Old Testament. Their, a number of their, their messages were going back to these books and saying, you were told what to do in the beginning and you chose not to do it. This is why you're in the shape that you're in. This, this is why this is going on. So I learned a lesson of... Don't forget God. Beginning in verse 6, Deuteronomy uh, chapter 8. Uh, Therefore you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God to walk in his ways and to fear him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land of brooks of water, of fountains and springs that flow out of valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, of vines of fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive oil and honey, a land in which you will eat bread without scarcity, in which you will lack nothing, a land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills you can dig copper. Uh, when you have eaten and are full, then you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land which he has given you. Verse 11, beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments, his judgments, and his statutes which I command you today. Lest when you have eaten and are full and have built beautiful houses and dwell in them and when your herds and your flocks multiply and your silver and your gold are multiplied and all that you have is multiplied. When your heart is lifted up and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage who led you through the great and terrible wilderness in which fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty land uh, were, uh, were, were there where there was no water, who brought water for you out of the flinty rock. So you see in these verses, Moses was telling them, God's going to take care of you. It's going to be great when you get into your land. It's not going to be perfect. Um, but, you know, and you have to do something to take this land. And you see the battles in the book of Joshua. Um, but God said, I'm going to take care of you. But immediately, you know, in the, the next book, the book of Judges, that cycle of forgetting God, Sinning, going into captivity, pleading for God's help, God delivering them, forgetting God, sinning, going into captivity. I mean, it's that same circle in the book of Judges from beginning to end. And, and they're just doing what God, through Moses, told them not to do. And uh, you say that again uh, throughout the rest of the Old Testament, through the periods of the kings and following the kings. They, you know, they... And it's some, you see that happen quite often today, you know. We, uh, we, we, it's, it's always better to humble ourselves and stay on God's side and not forget Him and not forget all that uh, He has, uh, has done for us. So that's a lesson that I remember from Deuteronomy chapter 8 is, is remember how God has, has blessed me in my life. Well, 
mother instead of church. Sure, yeah. It's yeah. like most of it's like, hey, you forgot. Yeah. Or you're not doing what you're supposed to do. And it's not quite necessarily, I think, the point where they completely forgot God, but they're, they're heading that way. They are. They're on the threshold of it. Yeah, the Revelation letter, chapters 2 and 3, those churches, I think five of the seven were being condemned, only two uh, were not. And, um, but that's what it was. They were on the verge of completely forgetting God. And God says, I'm going I'm to let you go. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you go. So it's just, it, you see that just continual cycle. And, you know, it's unfortunate, but you, you still see it today. Um, not that we're living in times that Deuteronomy and these other places were prophesying about, but the... the, the, the the sinful nature of most the same, you know. We we need something, so we turn to God. We get it, so we turn away from God. Most people, most, you know, a, a lot of people, I should say. I don't know, but that's where we allow our faith to continue to build in his word and never forget him and continue to depend on him and, and rely on rely on him. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I think you see that in general in life as as, as well. Um, of course, you know we, we 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 look to the Bible for our our direction, um, and we know that you know with with God's blessings. I, th- I think in in general sometimes you just see that when 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 people are blessed, even when it's in in the worldly view of it. I was reading something recently um, uh, in one of the Middle Eastern countries, maybe maybe Qatar. They're they're kind of their prince or they're one of their one of those Middle Eastern countries, top man and ultra wealthy country with oil and everything. And you know, I was reading. He said, you know, his grandfather, his great grandfather. He said, you know, he 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 rode a he, very poor, rode a donkey, <laughs> you know. And then you know, here we are with all of this wealth now. And he's talking about, you know, this is what we're driving. And he said, but my grandchildren will go back to a donkey. And he's saying because we will not handle it the right way and kind of spoiled in some ways and he's saying they'll lose it and uh, it was interesting to hear that from you know someone like that position like that and that's what happens quite often I do believe um, I've always kind of been a little concerned when I hear people say my kids aren't going to have it as hard as, as, as I had it um, as, as long as we're still teaching values <laughs> That I, I, I can understand, but quite often that means I'm going to give them everything they want, and um, that usually doesn't doesn't bode well for the adult life. And so, um, you know that. But that happens quite often with whether it be our children or grandchildren, or the next generation, whatever it might be. Um, if we don't teach them the same hard work and values, then where are they going to learn it? Don't forget the Lord because. You know, we're all, we all, we are also guilty of like the rich man in Luke chapter 12 that says, you know, I, I've done so you've done well for yourself, tear down your barns and build bigger and sit back and relax. And, uh, we, we all get comfortable and, and when times get hard, we get the ground break. Uh, but when things are going well, we tend to forget. And I had a youth group boy tell me one time, he said, you know, I, I purposed in his heart to add in his prayer to tell God how much he loves him. So we don't tell God how much we love him. So his public prayers always included uh, a love for God. It was with an idea of being appreciative for God during the good times. So that when the times do go bad, you don't look like a hypocrite. You know, good times and never pray bad times to hit the ground and pray hard. You know, his, his intent was to convey, you know, thanks. We do the same thing when we travel, like, 
pray for safety before you travel and you pray for safety while you're somewhere and when you get home typically you don't pray thank you for <laughs> keeping us safe this whole time I don't pray fervently for safety and then you never follow it up with a sure. uh, thank you or something like that so we, we kind of lose focus in, in our simplistic luxurious lives that we live you know we lose focus so the Deuteronomy message is clearly heard don't forget, when you're in this wealthy land, when you're enjoying all the needs of the land, and you're well taken care of, don't forget sure. how, how God brought you. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Great discussion. Okay. Nope. Mm -hmm. Actually, I had another thought with that as well, too, kind of related to, to recent <laughs> And I, I can't really put my finger on it, but with the whole thing that happened, what was supposed to be the football player that just had the cardiac incident on the field? Mar, Demar, Demar, or something like that? Okay. And it, because it was interesting to watch, and, and all of a sudden the prayer became acceptable again. And I don't know why, but there's something that troubles me about it. And maybe it's not, not that people were praying, don't get me wrong, that's what I mean, but why all of a sudden is prayer acceptable? Why is it that it wasn't before? Why, why when Tim Tebow took a knee on the field, everybody was mocking him? And all of a sudden, somebody goes down with a heart attack, and all of a sudden, we're, we're beseeching God. Why wouldn't we be beseeching God before? You know, as, as a country, as a nation, why wouldn't we be doing that? I mean, obviously, I think we in the church were, but I mean, why? why all of it? And, it, and I guess it, it has me wondering. I mean, I'm sure it will, but is it going to go away as quickly? Probably, yeah, it was just after 9 11, you know, for about what six weeks, six months, maybe something like that. Everybody in America was religious, <laughs> you know, church buildings were packed, um, but it, it fizzled out. And so, you know, stuff like that sometimes causes people to, to think differently and, and look at life differently. And um, so that happens. But, you know, it's, it's kind of like in the book of Judges, you see that cycle. You know, you see that cycle. If, you, if we're not attached to our anchor, as the Hebrews writer talks about, in our faith strong in him, then, then the, the events of the world are not enough to keep you going. That's the thing. It's emo the emotional ride of the world is not enough to sustain your faith. And that's what we have to remember. You know, it's, if, if, we're, if we're doing what we do just because of emotions or the, the, the current day situations, well, then we're like the wind that James talks about. We're tossed to and fro. You know, it has to be something stronger than that, deeper than that. It has to be based on the Word of God and a strong faith in Him, or we will change as often as what the, the, the world around us changes. That's just the way, it, yeah. So I, I, I think that, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, sometimes it might cause a few to, um, you know, to, to um, really think and come back around, but I think the, the, the general population, by and large, you know, you get that emotional charge and then, then it fizzles out. Notice also um, Leviticus chapter 10, all people must obey God. I've given the uh, reference of Genesis chapter 3. Uh, here's, that was Adam and Eve, first man, first woman. But God, God, they were still accountable, right? They were still accountable to God um, for the sin that they committed in Genesis 3. I think often of um, Simon the sorcerer in Acts chapter 8. You know, here was a man that when he tried to buy the gift of the Holy Spirit, he seems to still be a babe in Christ, perhaps only weeks old, but he was still accountable for that sin that he committed after baptism. And Peter said, you will perish. So they were accountable. Well, Levit Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 and 2, Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, the sons of the high priest, the nephews of Moses, each took censure and put fire in it, put incense on it, and offered profane fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. There's that word not that we came across in Genesis chapter 3. So fire went out from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. We're all accountable to the Lord. And that's something to remember, both in your, your personal life. Remember, I'm accountable you know, for what I do um, on Judgment Day, you know, the greatest gathering ever, followed by the greatest separation ever. We'll all 
individually give an account uh, for life lived according to the word of God, John chapter 12 and verse 48. Um, so I want to surround myself with godly influences and Christian influences, but, um, but I must remember that ultimately it's what I do. I'll be judged according to the word of God, the same as everyone else will be judged according to the word of God. But a second lesson that I learned from this is to, to get to know someone before I render judgment, whether it be good or bad. Now, we know what the Bible says about judgment. You, you know, don't, not at face value. You get to know them, know them by their, their works, their fruit. There have been those that may be... Uh, Okay, okay, let, let, me, let me finish this thought just real quick. Um, and so, um, you know, sometimes there's that of, um, you know, m maybe family or friend association is that of, I'm thinking, hey, this person is probably a strong Christian. I think of gospel preachers that, because I've known their dad or siblings or whatever it might be, that, you know, hey, this must be a great gospel preacher. And then, you get to know them a little more and think, oh, wow, well, there's, there's some things that's being taught here that's not exactly biblical, <laughs> you know. So, uh, um, so it's always important, you know, here were the, the nephews of Moses, but yet they had, um, they, they did wrong. They did wrong and they were accountable for it. So that's something that I remember. All people must but obey God. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, if you're just talking about a strange farm and stuff, mm -hmm. uh, Okay, okay. So, sure, yeah. So, uh, a couple of things. When you're in the Levitical law, um, when you're looking at these books, Exodus uh, through Deuteronomy, remember uh, the Lord gave specifics on uh, the offerings that they were to offer. Uh, there, there was specifics on all of those and, and how they were to offer uh, and what tithes to offer. Uh, so, so I'd have to go back and look at the verses uh, in the book of Exodus, I believe. Uh, I'd have to go back and look at those uh, verses to see exactly what they did wrong in this particular uh, case um, with, uh, with this that um, they were offering at this particular... Does anybody know on the top of your head? That's off the top of my head. I just, it's, it, it was the, the offering that they were offering here. Um, Right. So in verse 3, Moses says, you know, I mean, this is what I've been trying to say. He says that God has to be glorified. Mm -hmm. And so that was these gentlemen were glorifying themselves by choosing what they wanted to use and what they wanted to do rather than following the instructions of God. And God is not glorified in that. When we do what God says specifically that He's laid out for us to do, God is glorified. Sure. And so that was a real sin in it, to, to not glorify God by following self. Great, great point from verse 3. Great, great point from verse 3. Did you, did you hear that from verse 3, not glorifying God? Um, it, it, so, but but, but keep, keep in mind that um, here... You know these two were were priests, so so you're you're tying in, not just you're, you're tying all of that in at the, at this point in time, of uh, it goes back to we must do it exactly the way God has laid it out. <laughs> this case would have been um, Or did they go to the sensor where they're supposed to go and get the fire from the uh, from the sensor that was to burn continually out of the temple? You know, they took a shortcut and they, they stopped at a, at a burning dung hill and they just grabbed fire and lit it. You know, that's they, just, they weren't authorized to grab any old fire. They were instructed, you are going to get fire from this. Uh, Leviticus chapter six talks about the altar being lit as the same lit. Uh, that they were to go and get and source that fire and they were to keep it burning forever and that was how they were supposed to ignite it. But I can't tell you where it came from. If, if they stopped, you know, if there was a forest fire and they just grabbed some sticks and 
Chapter 9, verse 24. Yeah. So say Leviticus, Leviticus 6, 12. Fire at the altar shall be kept burning, and on it shall not go out with the priest. Uh, the priest shall burn wood on it every morning, and he shall lay out the burnt offering on it, and offer up the smoke of fat portions of the peace offering. Fire shall be kept burning continually, and the altar does not to go out. Uh, so it doesn't tell us where they had got their fire. But they, it wasn't, it wasn't the same fire that was supposed to be used. Yeah, but it, it ultimately, it was not authorized by God. And as was mentioned, they were not glorifying God uh, in this way. Um, and what would cause them to do that, I mean, in, the, the Bible doesn't say specifically. Um, the, the idea is, if you continue to read down to verse 9, that um, perhaps they were, they were under the influence of strong drink. That's the idea believed by some. Uh, at that point, um, what they were doing that uh, one way or the other they were they were accountable to God for not doing what he had authorized and not glorifying him. Good question makes us think anything else on that yeah as someone who was raised in the church, my dad my parents were raised in the church, my grandma was a preacher like Things get very conceptual. At least that's been my experience. Um, do good, do right, glorify my God. But details matter, and I think that, especially for those of us who have been Christians for longer periods of time, we have to remember when we're studying. You know, for example, how many of us have taught a fourth grade class and they ask you questions about a specific in your life? studied those kinds of stories in so long because well, we know the story of Jonah. We know the story of those are. And I think we need to pay attention to those things and go back in and make sure that we're not just like, oh, I know that. And assuming that we well, we've read that, we know it. Because the detail matters. And if we're not studying that, we don't, we don't know it or remember it without studying God's word and that way we can be our authority throughout. You know, and you see that quite often throughout the Bible with Cain and others um, taking what seems like it's minor uh, in the worldly view of things uh, that there's not a big deal to it, but with God it always is. And it's always important that we do it exactly the way the Lord tells us to do it. Notice also, um, God means what he says. This is what kind of all of this is wrapped up in this. But uh, Numbers chapter 15, verses 32 through 36 um, in everything we've, we've studied and will study, um, we, we see that God said, yes, yes, I mean what I, I said. 
to Cain. Yes, I mean what I, I said. Numbers chapter 15, beginning in verse 32. Now, while the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man gathering sticks on the Sabbath day. And those who found him gathering sticks brought him to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation. They put him under guard because he had not been uh, explained what should be done to him. And then the Lord said to Moses, The man must surely be put to death. All the congregation shall stone him with stones outside the camp. So as the Lord commanded Moses, all the congregation brought him outside the camp and stoned him with stones, and he died. Um, so, you know, here's just another example of, um, you know, God, you know, you, you go back to Exodus chapter 20 with remembering the Sabbath day and keeping it holy. Uh, God, uh, God meant what he said. Uh, the same as what we just looked at, Leviticus chapter 10 and, and other places. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 8, for example, don't forget me. This will happen. You know, some of it might be immediate, uh, as was the case with this man in uh, Numbers chapter 15. Some of it might be, it might take time. It might be years and years down the road. Uh, for example, when a nation as a whole is going astray, it might take time for that captivity to come about. Um, but um, God means what he says. And that's a lesson that we need to remember today and uh, continue to remember uh, when we're looking to that, which is specific to us when it comes to salvation, worship, and daily living. Because, you know, quite often it's easy, you know, to get wrapped up in to the current ways of the world and say, well, does this really matter anymore? Is this really important anymore? It, what some would say and we must make sure that we're always going back to the Bible for our authority and on, on all things so um, we see that uh, uh, it, certainly you know God does mean what what he says and that's important to remember let's, let's, I want to make sure we, we uh, catch this one as well uh, Exodus chapter 12 and verse 26 Exodus chapter 12 and verse 26 so uh, we, uh, we study this sometimes when taking the Lord's Supper. We looked at this the first Sunday of the year. We used Exodus chapter 12 and the first 14 verses. Talking about the Passover. And verse 26. And it shall be when your children say to you, What do you mean by this service? Children are watching. Grandchildren are watching. At church, when we're together, you remember the days when your children were just old enough to start grabbing stuff and the pew and they start grabbing for the Lord's Supper as it's passed by. They start asking, what is the Lord's Supper? They start wanting the Lord's Supper. They, Why do you take that? Why do you drink that? Why can't I have it? Well, tie that in directly to the Passover. You know, God's saying this is going to be a memorial, but it's also going to be a teaching tool. That's why we certainly encourage uh, having family at church for every service, uh, but not just at church. It's what we're doing at home and uh, when we're out and when we're uh, conducting business or whatever it might be. They're watching. They're picking up on it. They're remembering. And so that's important that we remember and, and realize uh, as, as well um, because they, uh, you know, it, it, you, we learn a lot of life lessons from our children, don't we? And uh, it's, it's important that we're teaching them and being the, the right example before them uh, because they are, they're watching. God said, you know, they're going to say, what do you mean by this service? And he gave them a way to teach future generations. Well, that's, the same happens today still, of course. You know, why, why, do you, why do we go to church? Why do we take the Lord's Supper? And all of those questions. So uh, the bell's going to ring in a minute. Let's, uh, cl let's close on that thought. Any, any, anything you want to add to that? All right, well, thank you so much for being here, being a part of class and being a part of the discussion. Um, we'll, um, we'll notice some more uh, next week uh, as we, we uh, look to a little more of this and then get into Genesis chapter 1. And uh, so the bell should be ringing any moment now, and then we will have our, our devotional period.